Hello and welcome to the Patent Literacy Symposium in this session, but I've tried everything, what to do when the intervention didn't work. My name is Dr. Amanda Cipolla, and I'm joined by my colleague, Andrew Bell, who is the East Regional Lead for Literacy. We're excited to facilitate this session for everyone, but before we start, we do have a few housekeeping items. You can access the presenter handouts for this session, the presenter bio, and the conference schedule on the patent website, and the link is provided in the chat for you. Just as a reminder, this session will be recorded and is 75 minutes. To access closed captioning, click on the icon CC Live Transcript on the Zoom panel. If you experience technical difficulties, please go to the Technical Support Guides area above the schedule on the symposium page. This is a webinar. So because it is a webinar, your microphones have been muted and your video feature has been turned off. We would love for you to to tweet out to, or share on social media all you are learning from the Literacy Symposium. And the hashtag for the symposium is PatentLit2022. And now we would like to introduce you to Matt Bur Matthew Burns. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really excited to be part of this conversation. I said this in my earlier session too, but I, I just really admire the work that that patent does and uh, really jump at the chance to support them in any way. Uh, my advisor in grad school was Jim Tucker, who was the uh, who was the director of special education for the state of Pennsylvania when they went to when the state went to instructional support teams. Some of you might remember that. So I just feel like kind of an intellectual connection to to uh, Pennsylvania, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this conversation. So thank you for for being at this session. So I became interested in this work back actually when I was a practitioner. I'm a school psychologist, and uh, I'm a professor of special education. But my training, et cetera, is in, is in school psychology. And, um, you know, we used to go to these problem solving teams and we'd sit there for half an hour at the problem solving teams and we'd say stuff like, well, you know, look at his, he, I have his older brother and he, you know, he had the same problem and it's kind of a working memory issue. And, well, what if we tried this? That'll take too long. And, and you say, well, what if we try this? And they say, but I've already done that. And we wind up reducing the spelling list. Moving, moving into the front of the room. And, and you think I'm kidding, but honestly, I just finished a study. We published it about a year ago, in which we looked at recommendations in school psych reports. And by far, number one and number two was preferential seating, reduced work list. So honestly, front of the room, reduced spelling list was the most common or the two most common recommendations. So I, I, that was really kind of, it's so frustrating you had a meeting and this person says, I've already tried that. You know, what do I do now? And you don't have a good answer. And I experienced that for myself in a very profound way with little, little Lonnie. Let me tell you about Lonnie. That, that wasn't his real name. Lonnie was a kindergartner uh, back in, in Minneapolis when I was at the University of Minnesota. And Lonnie was a great kid. And we were trying to teach him letter sounds. Now we taught him phonemic awareness and he did quite well with that. But now I was trying to teach him letter sounds. And he just couldn't learn it. And we tried, I chose that word on purpose when I say couldn't learn it. Of course he can learn it, but just, we thought just couldn't learn it. We just, we tried everything, every research-based intervention we could think of, and none of them seemed to work. And we see this over and over again. Like here, you know, we've got a group of kids. We did this uh, uh, this project, the, the press project in, in Minnesota. We had this nice grant to study and develop an, MT, an MTSS system. And we had a well-designed tier two intervention system that worked across multiple schools. And across all those schools, we found 17 kids that we thought needed a tier three intervention. So a very small number. And these are the data from those kids. We had 17 kids that, you know, their rate of growth just wasn't very good. Now, student five rate of growth is, this is a slope. So this is average, in this case, words per minute per week. Why that kid was on this list after six weeks of going up that much, I don't remember. Probably started off really low and, and stayed really low, but senior making good progress, but you know, some of these kids are making negative, quite this kid, large negative growth. I mean, these kids just weren't growing at the rate we needed them to. We see that all of us go through that when we work with kids. And Lonnie, the kid I talked about previously, was a, a special puzzle. Now, oftentimes, we, of course, when that, that's the case, we go to the problem solving team. Okay, what do we do? Well, we meet and talk about it. Well, that's, that's great. And I'm actually an advocate for problem solving team. But when you look at the data, we did a meta-analysis, uh, gosh, almost 20 years ago now, and we looked at two things. First of all, the, these are effect sizes. So generally speaking, the effect size of 0.8 is a large effect. It's a standard deviation between the treatment and control group. So in this case, you know, we see a 0.8 effect size. The, the treatment group 
did 0.8 standard deviations better than the control group regardless of the measure. So in this case, we saw you know, overall 1.10, huge effect. Well, that's great, problem solving teams are effective. But when you dive into the research a little more clearly, you, clearly you see if it was started by a university professor who had a grant and was studying it, the effect size was huge. But if they were just studying a team that existed in the field, it was much smaller at 0.54. I mean, still not terrible, but much smaller than if it were a university-based team. And we saw that fighting. We were very perplexed by that. We said, why is that? Well, they probably don't implement the problem-solving team the correct way. But, but most importantly, we think our conclusion, and I'm, this is not my quote. I stole it from Janet Graydon, who said she stole it from Jim Isodike. But most problem-solving teams don't actually solve problems. They admire them. We sit around for 30 minutes and talk about how terrible the kid's problem is, right? Like I was talking about earlier, we talk about his older brother was the same way as, you know, his, uh, you know he met his mom. And, and uh, you know, we do this for 30 minutes. And then 28 minutes in the meeting, we say, what do we do? And we move him to the front of the room and reduce the spelling list. So we need to stop admiring problems and actually get to problem solving. So one key to that is a good problem analysis framework which is something that we tend not to use. Now, coming back to my little friend, Lonnie, the, the kid, the kindergartner, man, we couldn't think of what the heck to do with that kid. And so we actually decided to go back to basic learning theory and figure out how to help him. So what we did was we look at, the, this is developed after this, but the National Center on Intensive Intervention, their framework to intensify interventions. They say, start with a good tier two intervention protocol. Okay, we had that, we had good interventions in place. Model student progress, if they're doing well, great, just keep doing it. If not, collect additional diagnostic data and either adapt the intervention or switch the intervention and then continue to progress monitor. Okay, that's good. So what we hadn't done and what most schools don't do and need to do a better job of is get additional diagnostic data. Hey, I tried those interventions. I did it with integrity. They don't work. What do I do? In that case, we collect additional diagnostic data to see what the kid needs, right? Now, probably talking mostly to my school psych friends here for a second, but oftentimes when we talk about, um, when we talk about collecting additional diagnostic data, we tend to think of, I think, the wrong data. So we might take a kid who's really, really doing poorly and really kind of figure out what's going on, and we'll do like an, a cognitive measure to find out working memory, processing speed, all that kind of stuff, and derive interventions based on that. So we did a meta-analysis, we published this in 2017, where we wanted to see, you know, does that effect work? And so we looked at measures of cognitive functioning. We found eight studies that use measures of cognitive functioning to derive reading interventions. And the average effect size was 0.17. Doesn't work. Remember, 0.8 is a large effect, 0.5 is okay, and 0.2 or less is weak. This is really a weak effect, and probably about the same as if you did almost any type of modification. So collecting more data to dive into it didn't seem to be the answer. Because only eight studies looked at that with the average effect size of 0.17. And so when I hit the literature, I found several meta-analyses that looked at a very similar question. The, among these 203 studies, the average effect size was only 0.27. So clearly using measures of cognitive processing to develop interventions like, you know, when I say that, I mean like processing speed, um, working memory just didn't translate to good effects in reading or math. So I want to draw your attention back to this, these data again. Remember, eight studies looked at measures of cognitive functioning, but we found 13 studies looked at direct measures of phonemic awareness, and 11 studies looked at direct measures of reading fluency. And here, the average effect sizes go way up to 0.5 and 0.3, 0.43, much better, much more in that moderate range. So I would suggest that if the kid, if we need additional diagnostic data, we have to think of a skill by treatment interaction, not an aptitude by treatment interaction. I've said for, for many years, what's the best way to teach a kid how to read? You teach them how to read. What's the best way to assess reading? You assess reading. Can the kid read to you? Can, does he have phonemic awareness? Can he sound out words? And we use those data to intensify the intervention. Now, so what we're going to do is this. We're going to, I'm going to ask all of you, you don't have to do it right now. I mean, you can do it now if you'd like, but I'm, I'm not, I can't see you, but, but if you wouldn't mind taking a second and freeing up whatever's in your, your hands 
and put your hands together as if you're holding a golf club. Okay. Okay. You just did one of three things. You either went, okay, you did that, or you went, I'm going to do this, or you went, what's he, what's he talking about? Maybe you Googled it, golf grip, right? Don't know what to do. That demonstrates the phases of learning. When people learn things, they go through very specific phases. We start off in the acquisition phase of learning. That's when you have no idea what's going on. You're slow and inaccurate. That's those you want. What's he talking about? I don't know. Now, when you're slow and inaccurate, you can experience frustration because you want to know what's going on. And so you tend to seek a model. So the most important thing we can do for kids who are just initially learning something, not, not even kids, anybody, when they're just initially learning something is lots of modeling with explicit instruction, immediate corrective feedback. Now, once they learn it, they can do it, but they really, really, really have to think about it. That's those of you who might have gone, oh, golf grip. I remember that. You do something with your fingers. You can do it, but you have to think about it. That's the kid that counts on his fingers. That's the kid that reads sound at a time. They can do it. They just really, really, really have to think about it. Those kids are accurate, but they're still slow. For those kids, lots and lots and lots of practice. Practice is so important for those kids. You know, with some pushback, do, do you know, do, do we really, are we really worry about speed? Does speed really matter? Well, it really doesn't. What matters is automaticity. You cannot move into generalization. You cannot generalize it until it's automatic. So that means generalization is applied to a novel setting. Take what you learned, apply it somewhere else, right? So that uh, you cannot move from, you cannot generalize it until it's automatic. How do you know it's automatic? Speed. That's why speed matters. Speed doesn't really matter per se, but what matters is do that, is it automatic? And the best way to measure that is speed. So if the kid's slow and inaccurate, lots of modeling, but if they're accurate, but slow, lots and lots of practice. Practice is really important. Um, once they can do it at sufficient speed and accuracy, that's when they can generalize it. And then once they can generalize it, that's using the information to solve problems. So I have a, a, a my, my little boy, although he's now a 21 year old, six foot five man, but back when he was a little guy, I was teaching him how to play t ball. And I went and bought this little tiny aluminum bat. And I was showing him how to swing this aluminum bat. And as I'm showing him, I'm thinking, man, this bat is so small, it could fly out of my hands really easily. And it's aluminum, it, it could hurt someone. So I thought about it and thought, okay, here's what I'll do. I'll hold the bat like I do a golf club. And then I could swing that bat as hard as I want and it wouldn't fly out of my hands. Take something you learn, apply it to different stimulus to solve a problem. Awesome, that's the goal, right? That's what we're all about. But if the kid is functioning down here, they can't do this. We have to figure out where in this learning sequence the kid is and match the intervention to it. Lots of modeling, lots of practice, or training for generalization. So I want to take that entire process and break it down into basically three phases. Learning it in the first place, remembering it, or generalizing it. Okay, our task then is to go back and figure out, where's the kid functioning? Now, generally speaking, an important criterion is how do you know when you move from acquisition to proficiency? Generally speaking, I want to see about 90% accuracy, okay, 90% accuracy. I know a lot of people talk about 80%. I've never understood 80% mastery. That, that's an oxymoron. I still think 90% mastery is an oxymoron, but, but once you get above 90%, measurement error can be a factor, et cetera. So 90% are, shows pretty well. And I based this on a meta-analysis I did uh, several years ago, 90% um, predict pretty accurately that you're going from acquisition to proficiency. You're accurate and you're ready for lots and lots of practice. So I want a kid to get about 90% accuracy. And actually with connected text reading, it's a little higher, like 93 to 90, 97%. It's a little higher. 93% for connected text, everything else. Sight words, letter sounds, math facts, spelling words, 90%. But for reading actual text, it's gotta be more like 93 to 95, 93 to 97%. So let's take a look at this kid here. This little guy, uh, they, were, they called us up and said, he was in third grade, and said, we're doing repeated reading with the kid. I'm going to talk about repeated reading a couple times today. It's a really solid intervention. I'll show it to you and talk more about it in a minute. 
a repeated reading is basically in the name, right? It's, it's a fluency building. It's you have the kid read a passage, give them error correction, read it again, read it again, read it again. So practice reading it and then do a hot read. So cold read, practice, 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 hot read. So do that with this little guy and they weren't seeing any growth. So this right here is words read correctly per minute. And this is percentage of words read correctly per minute. Because until a child can do it with at least 90% accuracy, I don't care how quickly they do it. I wanna see accuracy. Once they're accurate, then, then speed's really important. So this little guy, his words read correct per minute was low, but his accuracy was low. So they started with, with repeated reading and it wasn't working. We said, you know what? You're doing the wrong, inter wrong intervention. Stop. Get the kid accurate first. So we switched the intervention to an intervention called duet reading, which I'll show you in a few minutes, but it's a modeling intervention designed to build accuracy. So once we got the kid accurate, then his fluency took off. So let me show you. So here we started off as reading fluency was low. Well, it's because it's not accurate. He's not, it's hard to see on the scale. He's not, well, maybe one exception is not over 93% of the words correct. Stop, do duet reading, get him accurate, which we did. Now go back to repeated reading and look at his rate of growth there compared to there. Same intervention. Here's repeated reading, here's duet reading, here's repeated reading again. Great growth, because he was accurate. Once we got him accurate, then repeated reading, which is designed to build fluency, you know, proficiency, make it faster, then it, then it worked. Different kids, same scenario, poor little guy. As word, they were doing repeated reading, it was not working at all, but look at his accuracy, it's below 85%. They're, um, like you people, you're torturing them, please stop. So we stopped and switched to duet reading, which we got him accurate pretty quickly again. Now switch back to repeated reading, look at his rate of growth there compared to there. And third kid, same scenario, doing repeated reading with him for a long time, wasn't working. He wasn't accurate, switch to duet reading, get him accurate, switch back to repeated reading, look at his rate of growth there compared to there. And these are the data shown experimentally. We published this in learning and um, reading and writing quarterly. So again, it really comes back to learning it in the first place, remembering it, or generalizing it. Okay. So Lynn Fuchs recently published her um, her phase, her strategies for intervention intensification, Fuchs et al., 2017. Now it's a nice approach. And she has some, um, this is a handout. I give this to you as a handout. She has a nice approach here where she said dosage, alignment for acquisition, transfer for generalization, comprehensiveness. So, so dosage means number of sessions, number of opportunities to respond, minutes. Alignment means actually addressing what the kid needs. Generalization means helping the kid use it in different contexts, explicitly training for that. And then comprehensiveness means um, including aspects of direct instruction, like modeling and explicit instruction, building background knowledge, et cetera. So she put those four things out there. And what I'm saying is those four things map really nicely onto that learning hierarchy. So dosage, doses means, um, you know, the kid needs more practice, basically. Um, oh, I'm glad that you're putting chat in. I will try and respond to chat as, you, as they come through. So if you have questions and don't want to interrupt or something, please throw it in chat and I'll try to respond. Duet reading is what I mentioned. Yes, I'll show it to you in a few minutes. I have a video of it in just a few minutes, okay? Duet reading um, is with another kid usually, but can be in, uh, is with a teacher, but can be with another kid. I'll show you a video of it in just a second. So dosages, minutes, et cetera, that's perfect if the kid is accurate, but slow, need, need more practice. That's that fluency building, maintenance, remembering stage. Alignment means, um, it has to address what the kid actually needs. That's perfect for that first one. The kid's not accurate. The kid's not accurate because we're not addressing the right skill. Transfer for generalization, help the kids use it in different contexts. Well, that's obviously the generalization phase. That's for kids who are slow, I'm sorry, who are accurate and have enough speed and they're ready to generalize it. And then lastly, comprehensiveness is um, looking at modeling, explicit instruction. That's for kids who are slow and inaccurate. So dosage, let me, let me do it in the right order. Alignment and comprehensiveness, slow and inaccurate. Dosage, accurate but slow. Transfer for generalization, accurate and sufficient speed, ready to generalize. So let me walk through what that means. So when we come back to this idea of getting diagnostic, additional diagnostic data, 
Those are the type of diagnostic data I want to get. I want to see where is the breakdown is that occurring? And once we have that information, we can either switch the intervention or adapt it to address the kid's needs. Here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk through this quite a bit, Lori. I'll walk through this in quite a bit of detail, okay? That was just an introduction. So here's the diagnostic data I want you to think of. Think of these three questions. At the end of the intervention session, so when I sit down with the kid and I'm doing repeated reading or I'm doing whatever you do, word box, whatever, at the end of the lesson, can the kid do it? There's two answers to that, yes and no. It's yes, everything else is a no. At the end of the lesson, can the kid do it? If the answer is sometimes, that's a no. It depends, that's a no. Inconsistently, that's a no. Those are no's. Uh, at the end of the lesson, can the kid do it with 90% accuracy? If they can, then they've learned it in the first place. If they can't, then we need to uh, address that phase of learning. They're not learning it in the first place. So we need to look at how to intensify the intervention based on that. If the kids, yes, at the end of the lesson, they can do it. The next question is, the next day, does the kid remember it? Again, yes, everything else is a no. You know, sometimes, depends, those are all no's. So at the end of the lesson, the kid can do it, but tomorrow they've forgotten it. That means that we, did, we have to, that's where the breakdown's occurring. They're learning it, but they're not remembering it. And then the third one, yes, they, they remember it at the end of the lesson. At the end, they know it at the end of the lesson. They remember it the next day. But then if they do know it and they remember it, can they apply or use it? If the answer is no, we know that's where the breakdown just occurred, okay? So our first task is to look at the intervention session and say, at the end of the lesson, can the kid do it with 90% accuracy? At the end of the lesson, I'm sitting down right there with them, I, there with them, I just taught it to them, I show it to them, can they get it right 90% of the time? At just at the end of the lesson. If no, they're not learning it in the first place. If yes, then that's not the problem. Okay, the next day, if I show it to them, the next day, will they still get 90% accuracy? If no, then they're struggling with retention. They're learning it, but not remembering it. And then, you know, um, but then at the end, if they if they if they have good, learn it 90%, at least 90% right after you finish, remember the next day, then there's a good chance they're just struggling to apply it. The intervention that we use should vary, or the way we intensify it should vary based on where the kid, where that breakdown's occurring. And I bet as I'm talking, those of you who have do direct intervention with kids, I bet if I'm asking you, you, you could answer that question right now. If you think of a kid right now that you think it's not going well, and I say to you at the end of the lesson, can the kid do it? You usually can tell me pretty accurately. Yeah, he's, he knows it that day, but it's the next day. Someone even, I won't say who, but someone put in chat, uh, what happens if they get it right at, right? I hadn't, I hadn't gone through the slides yet, but said, what happens if they understand it right then, but the next day it's gone? And they put in a second, never mind, you, you just answered that. That person probably has a kid in their in their mind who seems to walk away from the lesson, got it, but then the next day it's starting all over again. That kid, the breakdown is occurring here. They're, they're learning it in the first place, but not remembering it. And then the kid learns it in the first place, remembers it, but can't apply it. Chances are you know where that breakdown is occurring. And if not, it doesn't take much data to address it. So once you determine they're struggling to learn it in the first place, to acquire it, struggling to remember it, retain it, or struggling to generalize it, then we either have to switch the, the validated protocol or adapt the intervention. I want to do right now is walk through the different types of adaptions or validated protocols for those three areas. Okay. So let's start with obviously acquire. Kids not learning it in the first place. Okay, they they it's a uh, uh, we sit down with the kid and we do the intervention with them, and then at the end we say, okay, you got it, and the kid has no idea. For those kids, there's two things I want to consider. Are we targeting the right intervention? Or do we need to be more errorless and salient? And I'll explain what that means. So let's talk about targeting the right intervention first. Oftentimes, if the kid's not learning in the first place, we're teaching the wrong thing and we need to back it up. We need to back it up. So for example, I, I think of reading. I'm going to focus on reading for a second and I'll talk about math in a few minutes. But and I won't spend a lot of time on, on any of these interventions. I'll spend more about, about the framework. But so basically for reading, 
you know, let's say the kid's in third grade. And so we do the cadence, dibbles, something like that, Ames Web, and that's our reading screener. We assess their fluency and they uh, score low. They score, they score well, then we probably look at comprehension, but let's say they scored low. For the kids that score low on fluency, then we look at their decoding skills. Can they decode? Okay, yes, then we intervene for fluency. If not, we look at their phonemic awareness. Our task is to find the most fundamental skill in which the kid struggles. So if we're, we assess fluency and that's low, we look at phonics. If that's good, we know fluency is the intervention target. If fluency is low and phonics is low, then we look at phonemic awareness. If fluency is low, phonics is low, but the kid has good phonemic awareness, we know phonics is our target, decoding is our target. If they're low across the board, then we focus on phonemic awareness. Okay. So now when I say focus on, I don't mean exclusively, absolutely, if you're doing a phonemic awareness intervention, you're going to be uh, teaching kids letter sounds and, and um, you know, et cetera. And absolutely, if I'm doing a, a decoding intervention, I'll have the kid read, I might do a, a one minute phonemic awareness warm up. I'm certainly gonna have the kid read connected text, but you really, I mean, here's the problem though. If the kid needs, needs phonics, needs decoding, and you're doing repeated reading with the kid, it's not gonna help. And that's what you see when the kid's not learning it in the first place. Your, your intervention focuses on fluency, but the kid actually needs decoding. Your intervention is focusing on decoding, but boy, this kid needs basic phonemic awareness. So at the end of the lesson, the kid's still lost. It might be because you're targeting the wrong skill and you got to back it up. I really encourage the schools to do this anyway, to go look at these big areas of the National Reading Panel. I attend a group I work on these four basic ones. And go back and look at your interventions and see which one it addresses. For example, sound partners. I, we, we work with our schools to basically develop a matrix like this. And I ended it at fifth grade, but it could have gone through high school basically because it looks very much the same which is, you know, road to the code for little kids for phonemic awareness, um, interventions for all phonological awareness for second and third grade. I don't deal with phonemic awareness beyond third grade because it's extremely rare for a child who needs uh, support uh, to still need phonemic awareness in, in fourth or fifth grade. Uh, then, But then sound partners, a great decoding intervention, kindergarten through second grade, uh, reading mastery, a, new, a, a better one, which I put on the now, maybe not better, but but easy, cheaper and easier is uh, phonics for reading by Anita Archer. So I use phonics for reading for third grade with because uh, sound partners only goes through second grade uh, and phonics for reading starts in third grade. Fourth grade rewards or phonics for reading, both written by Anita Archer, both strong decoding interventions. Fluency, six minute solution or read naturally, comprehension, reciprocal teaching. So if I'm giving a kid read naturally, who's in fifth grade, but they really need decoding, then I need to switch and use rewards. So the first step in the back it up is to think about, are we addressing the right skill? Okay, so are we addressing the right skill? Oftentimes in reading, if the kid's not learning it in the first place, we need to back it up a whole area. Don't do fluency, do phonics. Don't do phonics, do phonemic awareness. For math, we also back it up. Now math, he oftentimes works uh, quite well with objectives, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But if a kid's struggling to learn math in the basic, you know, uh, learning it in the first place, I really encourage you to consider the kid's conceptual understanding. Now, conceptual understanding, I mean uh, the understanding of the underlying ideas. Understanding of the underlying ideas. Uh, Bonnie asked, do these programs recommendations include students with dyslexia? Uh, yes and no. Yes, they do. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, I would say, though, that chances are children with dyslexia are probably going to need a little more intensification of things we're talking about today. But um, but that's a good place to start for all, pretty much most almost all those kids. So conception. So if a kid's really struggling with math, struggling to learn it in the first place, do they understand the basic idea? For example, I, we had a kid we're trying to teach um, basic addition to and wasn't learning it in the first place. So we developed this, this approach to assess conceptual understanding where in which we give the kid a visual picture, all the kids do is circle which equation goes with the picture. Okay, just circle which equation goes with the picture. And um, that'll, you know, and by the way, it'll be 90%, it'll be 90%, it'll, it'll basically 100% or 50%. They'll either guess or they get it all right. But if so, if, if I have a kid who's not learning in the first place, I might quickly pull out something like this and ask the kid to complete this to see if he understands the basic underlying ideas. 
Another approach I do is ask the kid to draw a picture of the problem and then explain how that picture represents the problem. If they can't explain to you, if they can't draw it, like, you know, for example, let's say it's two times three. And instead of saying, you know, uh, draw a picture of it, they should draw like two circles, two circles, two circles, right? Two, three sets of two circles. But they draw instead, you know, two circles and three circles, you know, that kind of thing. That clearly doesn't demonstrate that they understand, clearly demonstrates they don't understand what two times three actually means. So ask them to draw a picture of the problem, use the picture to explain the problem. And if they can't do that, they don't understand the underlying concept. So if the kid's not learning in the first place for math, maybe one of the first things you want to do is ask the picture, kid to draw a picture of the problem, see if they can use the picture to explain the problem. And if they can't, they don't understand the underlying uh, concept. We have a, little, a couple examples of this. This kid, we assessed they were not doing well. We're doing, I think this is a, a multiplication, basic multiplication. We assessed the kid, and our con conclusion was the kid understood it conceptually just fine. Now, in, in math, math intervention world, oftentimes if the kid's not learning it, we bust out the manipulatives and reteach it. And you know, manipulatives are an important part of teaching math, yes. But if they already understand it conceptually, teaching reteach it with manipulatives might not be the answer. So for this kid, we determined he understood it conceptually, but we still started by reteaching it with, manip with manipulatives and it didn't help. We stopped that and did the right intervention, which is we focused on the, the procedure and helped have the kid you know, sort of understand, uh, 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 do it faster and the kid took off. This kid was the reverse. This kid didn't understand it conceptually. So for this kid, we forced this kind of procedural intervention that didn't help. Once we switched to conceptual, it took off quite a bit. Okay, now needs to say, because the focus of this whole conference is on literacy, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on math, just make it, make a couple of, of quick points about it. Um, we did this cool paper, uh, myself and, and um, uh, Sandy Polis did this uh, paper just published in Psychology in the Schools, where we look at the different strands of math. And when you're, if you have a kid who's not learning in the first place, Maybe look and see, do they understand it conceptually? Can they do it procedurally? Do they have strategic competence, adaptive reasoning, and productive disposition? Because not all interventions, we found no intervention addresses all of them, but there was nice interventions for all of them. So if you have a kid who's really struggling with strategic competence, consider focusing more on CRA during your intervention or schema-based instruction. Okay, now coming back to reading. Um, so what is, okay, so number one, Decoding rather than fluency, for example, PA rather than decoding. So maybe we have to back it up a whole area. But sometimes we just need to back it up within the skill. What if we have a kid not learning in the first place and we're doing phonemic awareness? So we're not, no, we're not really back up any further, but we may, maybe we're doing, we're doing um, blending and segmenting and the kid needs basic isolation. He can't even isolate the sounds yet. So sometimes we have to back it up to an earlier skill within the same earlier sequence within the same skill. For example, maybe you're teaching, um, you know, digraphs, diphthongs, all that, and they, they need basic letter sounds. So you have to go back and look at, look at your diagnostic data. So for that, I might do, if the kid, if the kid needs, if we're doing decoding and the kid's not learning it in the first place, I might come in and Assess their phonemic awareness. Okay, we're doing decoding. The kid has good phonemic awareness. Okay, good. Decoding is the right target. Now I'm probably going to give that kid another decoding inventory. And there's lots of free ones out there. They're all fine to look and see, oh, geez, we're doing this skill within decoding, but the kid needs this one. Or phonemic awareness. There are lots of free phonemic awareness measures out there. They're all fine. We're doing this phonemic awareness skill, and the kid needs this one. So look to see the overall skill. And if that's if that's correctly targeted. So your data suggested that the kid needs decoding and you're doing decoding, great. Now get out that decoding inventory and dive in to see which objective in which the kid is struggling and target your intervention there. Okay. So back it up means maybe back up a whole area from fluency to decoding or decoding to phonemic awareness or to something with easier within that, within that um, skill. And by the way, let's say you're doing repeated reading. So repeated reading, um, let's see, do I read naturally see it right here? I do. So read naturally is a great little tool. I use it all the time. Um, you know, here's, you basically sit down with a kid and um, they read a passage that's at a particular level and they, they do, you, you graph how many words the kid read per minute. 
And then the kid practices it three more times. You do error correction and they do the hot read at the end and you graph it again, okay? Now, let's say you look at this and this is a fluency intervention and the data say the kid needs fluency. His decoding skills are fine, but he's still not doing well here. He's still not learning it in the first place. Well, that's the case. This is, um, this is uh, read naturally. Um, yes, I can. And, uh, and this is someone asked, I'm sorry, I forget you can't see the chat. Someone asked, uh, what book is that? This is just a book from Read Naturally. But you'll notice Read Naturally rates their book, rates the difficulty. This one's a 5.6, so 5.6 grade. What if you're doing that with a kid and they're really struggling it? So you're not going to switch to decoding, but instead you switch to an easier one, like a 5.0 or a 4.5 or something like that. The bottom of all the different letters. Here's a 3.0. Just, just to grab one. Oops. There you go. See. So maybe you need to switch to an easier level within repeated reading. So if the kid's not learning in the first place, think, how do you make it easier? You make it easier by moving up a skill, moving back a skill, I'm sorry, decoding rather than fluency, or easier within that skill. So you do a repeated reading, move up and just use, you move back and use an easier level of the text, or switch back and decoding to an easier skill. So someone said examples, there are lots of out there, if you just Google it, um, there's a lot, there are lots of free ones. And honestly, decoding is, is sort of decoding. It's a pretty easy uh, approach. Uh, let's see. And someone asked, are the slides part of the materials? Yeah, the slides should be, should be uh, what were a handout. Um, so just Google it. There's lots of free ones out there and they're all fine. So someone asked, how do I find the student's instructional level? Well, that is relevant because if you're doing repeated reading for the kid, it has to be the instructional level. I don't like almost any measure of instructional level. If I have to use one, I'll use a Lexile ranking. Otherwise, like Fontes and Pinal, DRA, you know, I've done, I did a study a couple of years ago where we found that we, kids who are struggling readers, when they read a book that was at their level, the Fontes and Pinal, kids who are struggling readers couldn't read it. They, it was at, they're, they're, they're a G and the book is a G, they, they couldn't read it. Uh, so instead, I looked look to see uh, I want to see if the kids can read 93 to 97% of the words correctly. 93 to 97% of the words correctly. And that's really the best way to assess it. We've done several studies on that, which for time's sake, I can't get into, but we've done several studies on that and consistently see if a kid can read 93 to 97% of the words, they'll, do, they'll see higher comprehension, higher fluency, higher time on task, higher task completion. Um, so what that means basically is for the good readers, I'm not too worried about it. However you assess instructional level for good readers is fine. But for those couple of kids in your class who really struggle, you want to make sure you get that instructional level right. So for those kids, you sit down, have them read to you for a minute, see can they read 93 to 97% of the words correctly. Um, someone's asking about progress monitoring. Yeah, I use I use uh, Acadians or Reading Fluency quite a bit. Oh, but, oh, Lena, I'm not sure I'm saying your name correctly. Yes, you're exactly right. Um, she said she uses Acadians or Reading Fluency, but often it's not sensitive enough to measure progress. Uh, I wish I had time to get into this in a lot of detail. I don't, but I'm just simply say this. Um, reading or reading fluency is a general outcome measure. It's designed to measure overall reading skills. If I'm doing a de basic decoding intervention with a kid, it, uh, that oftentimes won't show up in a reading fluency measure yet. So I monitor the progress two ways. I monitor the progress with a general outcome measure, a grade level or reading fluency measure like double Acadians or, or and not or and in the skill being intervened. So if I'm doing decoding, I'm going to monitor the progress in grade level or reading fluency and nonsense word fluency, for example. If I'm doing um, phonemic awareness, I might measure monitor the progress with a phoneme segmentation fluency measure as well. Those types of things. You're exactly right. It's not sensitive enough. So I I monitor the progress two ways with almost every kid with whom I work. All right, so. Kid not learning it in the first place, back it up. The other way, the other thing about not, not, not learning it in the first place is uh, you have to um, make it errorless and salient. All right, so I mentioned duet reading a couple of times. Let's come back to that. I hope this works. Let's see. If not, my website, good. Okay, is it working? Good. So let me make sure the sound is shared so you can hear it. All right, so uh, this is from my YouTube channel. Let me pull it up real quickly. If you go to YouTube and just search Matthew Burns, I come up. Uh, I have here um, 
a, a bunch of videos. Some are um, modeling or, you know, some are how to do various interventions. Uh, some are uh, interviews. So if I find a cool study that I think, oh, it's a really great study. I want practitioners to have a, a good understanding of this. I'll call the author and ask them to be uh, do a 15 minute interview about, about the study. So some are demonstrations of, of interventions. Some are conversations about a study. Um, yeah, it's one of those two things. Oh, some are lectures that I recorded for whatever reason. So, um, so do our readings on this list? Where are you, do our reading? It's in here somewhere. There it is. Do our reading. So, if you want the video I'm about to show you is is here, but there are there are tons of other videos here as well. All right. So. Let's try to look again. Such as supported or assisted closed reading. Today helping me is Karma. And what grade are you in, Karma? Second grade. Okay. Alright. So first, uh, please read this. Oh, you know what? I'll I'll he's gonna the first thing he's do is ask you to read. The first thing the kid does is read out loud. So you find a passage that, that is usually a grade level passage, and the kid's gonna read it out loud. Um, uh, you follow along, mark errors, and at the end, do error correction. But for time's sake, I'll skip that. That takes about a minute or so. So let's go ahead and skip that. I'll be right back here. So the error correction mistakes. Okay, now we are going to read together. I'm going to read the first word, so I, and then you will read the next word, was, and then we'll go back and forth reading every other word until the end of the passage. Do you have any questions? Okay, let's begin. I, whoops, sorry. Was walking down the road and found a man. It was neat. I picked it up to see where it would take me. Okay, let's stop there. Um, typically, you, you would finish the entire passage. And then after that, let's try it again. This time, you read the first word, and I will read the second word. I was walking. Down the road and found a map. It was neat. I picked it up to see where it would take me. Okay, then we'll stop right there. And now, after this, I would ask Karma to read the entire passage again. But in the interest of time, we will just stop here. Okay, by the way, that's David Klingbeil, who's now a, a professor, assistant professor, or maybe associate by now, at University of, of Wisconsin. But um, so this is, if you didn't catch the directions, you have the kid reads by themselves first, and you do error correction. Then you read it together. The kid reads first, you read second, kid third, you read fourth, and then you switch. You read it again, you switch. So then you read first, kid second, you read third, kid fourth, and then the kid reads it again. So four times the kids either read every word or had every their word modeled for them. Uh, this is designed to build accuracy, not rate. This is, oh, oh I, I'm sorry to notice there's some questions. I'll come back to them. This is accuracy, not rate, right? You're trying to get the kid to read the words more accurately. This is the kid who has good decoding skills, but when they read, they don't, they don't read a lot of accuracy. So this would be ideal for that kid. You see, it's how it's different than repeated reading, whose focus is on rate, trying to get it to go faster. This is trying to get them to be more accurate. Okay. Oh, good. Uh, oh, Lexile. How do I determine Lexile? Most measures, star, map, most measures uh, include a Lexile rating with it. So I just get the Lexile from that. Uh, let's see. Would you want to discourage the finger tracking as effective fluency? Now, in this example, that's a great point, uh, Gwen. But in this example, no, because the focus is on accuracy. Uh, do you pair students? Can you steer pair students? Yes, we have done that. 
um, one needs to be a, a, a better reader than the others. Like I talked about with, yeah, when you have a heterogeneous dyad, one needs to be a stronger reader, but you can do that. Uh, error correction occurred before the duet reading occurred. Yes, I skipped over it. Uh, after the kid reads, just like in repeated reading, after the kid reads, you go back and do error correction for all the errors. What do you do if you're stuck with F and P? I can't answer that question in the confines of this presentation. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, if you email me, whoever you are, I'm not sure what that is, but if you email me, I'll send you some studies I've done with F and P that, can, that demonstrate that it didn't work very well. Um, I'll be happy to send those, share those with you. All right. Great. All right. So, um, so this is designed for accuracy. This is for the kid who's got good decoding skills, but when it comes to learning reading fluency, they're just not getting it, just not learning it in the first place. For that kid, you want to make it more errorless and salient, so you use this. There are other possibilities. Now, the, the, there are many ways to do this. Uh, listening passage preview. Now, the one thing with that I don't like about duet reading is it's a word level intervention, right? It's word by word, which can be quite robotic, not a lot of, of prosody. So I get them off that as soon as I can. Uh, and I'll move to something like listening passage preview, where I, instead of reading every other word, I read the first two sentences, and then the kid reads those two, those two sentences back to me. And you go all the way down through the passage to, to you get to that. Um, here's directions here. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Again, the focus is on accuracy. I do two sentences at a time, because if you do one sentence at a time, the kid can parrot it back without ever really looking at the words. And if you do more than two sentences, that seems to be too much modeling and the kid kind of forgets it. So, so two sentences at a time, you read two sentences, the kid reads those two sentences, then you read the next two, kid reads those two, et cetera. That's called listening passage preview. It's a well-researched intervention. Uh, there's phrase drill uh, where you get, it's, it's an error correction where you say to the kid, uh, they make a mistake, you say, oops, that, stop, that word is house. What word? House. Good, now go back and read that sentence again. Good, read that sentence again. Good, read that sentence again. So you, you teach them the, the word, you say, oops, correct the word, but then go back and read it three times. And that's called phrase drill, where they practice reading it over and over again in the phrase in which they made the error. Okay. Again, focusing on accuracy, not speed. So if the kid's not learning it in the first place, it's probably, you have to either have to, move, either have to um, make it easier or back it up, okay? Either back it up or make it easier. So back it up to an easier skill, like you're doing fluency, you should be doing decoding, or decoding, you should be doing phonemic awareness, or an easier objective within that skill, you're doing digraphs, the kid needs basic letter sounds, um, uh, you're doing repeated reading with a 5.6, and it should be a 4.5, uh, or make it easier with lots and lots and lots and lots of modeling. So duet reading, lots of modeling. If, if you're doing decoding and the kid's not learning it in the first place, but they have good phonemic awareness, et cetera, then uh, you should do more explicit instruction and deliver more modeling of what that sound, that, that uh, letter, whatever you're teaching happens to make. So that's learning in the first place. Now, many of the kids we work with, I work with, I should say, many of the kids I work with, they're really struggling learning, learning in the first place. And most of the time, you gotta back it up. Almost every single time, well, 75% of the time, that's an estimate, you usually need to back it up. But if, you, but if not, then you gotta focus on more modeling and explicit instruction. Now, what about the kids who at the end of that lesson, man, they say to you, yep, got it. They walk out the door, come back the next morning and it's like you're starting all over again. And in my experience, that's a large number of kids. That's a large percentage of kids. A lot of the kids with whom I work, we're talking about intensifying interventions, we're really focusing on this. So same thing, we'd have to pick a validated intervention program or modify the intervention. How do we do that? Well. The best way I can think of to, to modify, I'm sorry, to use a different intervention program is to incorporate incremental rehearsal. Uh, incremental rehearsal was developed by Jim Tucker, uh, who I mentioned earlier, uh, in, uh, from Pennsylvania. Uh, he's not from Pennsylvania, he's from Texas, but um, uh, he's not from Texas, doesn't matter. He's, he, he lived in Pennsylvania for a while. Um, it's a flashcard folding in technique where you rehearse one new item at a, at a time with instructional level high repetition. So let me, again, go to my YouTube channel. And I won't show you the whole video, but there's lots of videos here about how to do IR. So let's start with incremental rehearsal for words. Um, let's start here. You don't have time to run a successful business and be the IT department. Mediacom Business Zero. I'm so sorry there are commercials. I explicitly, when I cre created this channel, said I don't want any commercials, whatever. 
and then all of a sudden commercials are appearing in my in my videos and it's so frustrating i don't know how to get them out IT Solutions, monitoring and managing your business internet and phone services so you stay focused on what you do best. Good, sorry. I'm going to demonstrate incremental rehearsal, which is an intensive intervention used to teach words for struggling learners who fail to learn with other approaches. Um, with this student, I'm going to teach two words, knock and slowly. And the words that I'm going to be using as known words are words that she already has in her vocabulary. Okay. So she's going to teach two words, knock and slowly. She's going to do that by using a bunch of words that the kid already knows. So she's going to use like eight known words and two unknown words, one word at a time. Okay, let's go right to the demo. Oh, no video. Two new words that you don't know yet. This word is slowly. Repeat it, please. Slowly. Can you use it in a sentence? My turtle moves slowly. Perfect. What's this word? Slowly. Long, slowly, long, drum, slowly, long, drum, ball. Good. Now again, remember, slowly is the unknown. All the rest are knowns. And knowns are words, words, math facts, letter sounds, whatever you're doing that the kid knows right away. Slowly, long, drum, ball, them. Slowly, long, drum, ball, them, call. Very good. Slowly. So you see what she's doing? She's showing the unknown, one known. Showing the unknown, two knowns. Showing the unknown, three knowns. And adding an, another known every single presentation. Long, drum, ball, them, call, day. Slowly, long. Drum, ball, them, call, day, four. Okay, again. Slowly, long, drum, ball, them, call, day, four, hand. Good. Okay, now we're going to introduce the second word and take one known word out. Okay, that's important. So she just taught that word, letter sound, whatever you're teaching. When she puts the next one in, you don't want the, if you have eight knowns and one unknown, you don't want to change the proportion, for, you know, one, you don't have, you no longer have one unknown, eight known, you have nine known, because you just taught that word. So when you put the next unknown in, take out a previous known. So the number of cards in your hand should always stay the same. And the process starts over again. This word is knock. Can you repeat it, please? Knock. Can you use it in a sentence? I have to knock on the door to get in. Good, perfect. Okay, what is this word? Knock, slowly. Knock, slowly, long. Okay, it starts over again. Now the order of the knowns doesn't matter. You can shuffle them every single time if you want. But the order of the unknowns does matter. So we found that kids need to see it about 25 times. At most kids, at about 25 times, it becomes automatic. But there's not much benefit once you go beyond 25. So if you do it 25 or 50, you get the same retention. But if you do it 10 or 25, you get a lot more retention for 25. You need to see it about 25 times. So if I have eight knowns, they'll see that first known eight times. Put the second one in, they'll see, they'll see this eight times. They'll see that first known seven more. Put it in again, they'll see that, you know, eight, seven, they'll see that first one six more times. So once you get in that 20 to 25 number, then then you know the order of that the, then it doesn't matter. But you got to keep the order of the unknowns the same. So they get that repetition. The order of the knowns doesn't matter. Okay, so someone asks, there's a couple questions coming in. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, in this example, words are selected. Yeah, they're, they're, they're red letter words. They're heart words, if you wanna call it that. They're um, uh, vocabulary words. Uh, we, again, we, the, this example is words. Uh, they could also be, by the way, words that the kid, when, you, when they read, just don't ever get right. Like, it could be that as well. Um, techniques in small group and keeping students engaged. Yes, uh, it can work in small groups. I've done it in small groups. I've never studied it in small groups. We've studied it uh, kids peer to peer, but never never the whole, you know, small group. They'll be engaged if the, if the knowns and unknowns are the same and you keep it fast paced. You gotta keep it fast paced. This is a little slow paced because they're just modeling it. Um, I do use interventions in small groups. Okay, yeah, just said that. But again, have to all the same knowns and unknowns, all the same unknowns, okay? Right, let's see. Uh, 
uh, opinion about whole groups phonics programs, they can be fine, but but you know the question asked about whole groups phonics programs, whole group phonics programs are fine, but you gotta have a small group uh, to go with it as well. Um, has there been research with similar methods with letter ID? Yes, we've done, I think four or five studies now. In fact, more than that, we've done uh, several studies where we look at letter ID, phonemes, graphene type thing, teaching the kid the, the, the sound that goes with the letter. We've done that a number of times. And a couple of them were kids who were English language learners as well. So we've done that research several times. Uh, is this a mixture one-on-one -on -one all the time, someone asked? Um, it, it's That's how we've done most of the research, but they have done research as it with it with um, part peers, with partners, you know, and also with, with small groups. Is incremental rehearsal accuracy? Yeah, incremental rehearsal helps you increase the retention. Incremental rehearsal helps you increase the retention. So if I know it, I, I learn it and at the end of the session, I, I know it, but I come back tomorrow and I've forgotten it, it'll help you remember that. All right, oops. Not else? And you keep going to get to go all the way through. Now in, in, in this, I'm using words, but there are several examples we did. We've done letter sounds here on this page, somewhere up here, there's letter sounds. Oh, here it is. Think about rehearsal with letter sounds. We've done math facts, uh, others as well. So, so there's videos there how to do each of those. Okay. Can we find the study somewhere? Well, there's two places I'm going to show you. Here's one. Here's uh, several studies. There's more. There's tons more. There's like 40 of them. So uh, if you want, um, look at these. If you want more. You, these I just noticed tend to be a little, little, a few of the older ones. So there's more recent ones. But I'll also su suggest you look here. So if you go to the Intent National Center for Intensive Intervention, which is just intensiveintervention.org, intensiveintervention.org, go to the tools chart and uh, academic interventions. Here's several studies. The tutoring buddy is just the, a computerized version of IR. Uh, and so here there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight studies looking at uh, uh, IR here as well. Oh, well, thank you, Andre. Uh, yes, so Gwen asked, this is all about, they've already tried to learn it, but they, they can't remember it. So yeah, that's the case. This is just designed to build retention. It's an intensive intervention. It's an intensive intervention. We don't start here. This is for the kids for whom are learning it in the first place, but don't remember it. Okay. And IR research has been rated quite well with strong effects. I was going to show one study. That was where that graph was, but we, we'll skip that because we, we talked about the research. So, so if the kid's not le learning it, the kid's learning in the first place, but not remembering it, it's all about repetition, 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 lots and lots and lots and lots of practice. Um, so, so I'll, Melissa, I'm gonna come back to your question in just a second here. Uh, a couple of you asked, um, someone said, what about partner reading paragraph shrinking? When would this intervention be used? Well, partner reading paragraph shrinking is not, is a tier one intervention. This is, this is tier three. Basically, so think tier three. So tier, part of the reading paragraph shrinking is, is tier one. And Melissa, I'll come back to your uh, question in just a few minutes. So if they're not learning in the first place, we have to have lots of practice, lots of repetition. So repeated reading is a great way to build that in as well. So again, for time's sake, I'm not gonna talk much about repeated reading. Um, uh, here's a script for it, a full script how to do it. There's videos on that website I showed you on the YouTube channel. And also, um, uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this. I gave you a script on how to do incremental rehearsal as a handout for today as well. Okay. Should you use incremental, incremental rehearsal in order of skill progression? Uh, uh, yes. Oh, um, yes. So the question was, should you wait until students learn letters before starting words? Yes. Um, IR is just the technique. It's, there's no curriculum to it. There's no, this, it can be done with almost any stimulus. So I would encourage you to use the stimulus in the order that you're already doing it and use that for, for IR. So here's how to do repeated reading. The only point I want to make on this, repeated reading has data built in, which are beautiful. Repeated reading, you do a cold read and graph it. This is the number of words you write correctly per minute. Then you do practice, practice, practice and a hot read. So in this case, the kid in the cold read went from 30, the hot read was a 55. Kid's second day, it went from like a 35 to a 
you know, about a 60. You know, we see nice big jumps every day. Now, what you're looking here is two things. You're seeing big jumps every day, but you also see the cold read going up. That suggests this is working really well. This is working really well. Uh, what articles do I use for repeated reading? Um, if you're not using um, Read Naturally or something like that, look at readworks.org. Readworks.org has a whole program. I don't use the program. I just use those passages that are part of the program. So readwork.org has a bunch of passages, thousands of them you can download and use for free. So this is a kid making really good progress, right? His, you're seeing big jumps within each session and he's going up every, every session. Now compare that to this kid right here. This kid, we see, we see not making big jumps during the session. If you go back to that, that framework of learning in the first place, not remembering it and not generalizing it, this kid is not learning it in the first place. The intervention session is not working. So if you do repeated reading and you don't see big jumps from cold to hot read, the kid's not learning it in the first place. Compare that to this kid for whom we see nice big jumps during the session, but his cold reads are staying flat. That's a kid who's learning it in the first place, but not remembering it. This kid, not learning it in the first place, look at the kid's decoding. If the kid has good decoding, if the kid doesn't have good decoding, you need to focus on decoding and not fluency. But let's say the kid does have good decoding, you're probably using a passage level that's too hard. Back up the passage level. This kid's learning in the first place, but not remembering it. So let's say for this kid, we're doing cold read, practice, practice, hot read. So for this kid, I will add in number of practices to build up repetition. So I would go cold read, practice, 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 hot read. Okay. So you want to see your data look sort of like this, where it goes up during the session and the cold reads are going up. If not, if they look like this, the kid's not learning it in the first place. You need to back it up either to decoding or to an easier reading passage. Or in this case, the kid's not retaining it. Add in more practice reads. So, and so it just the general principle, you know, increase number of practice reads for repeated reading. Use more examples and word sorts. Use more items and cover, copy, compare. You know, basically just get more practice. Is the hot read the same passage as the cold read? Um, there are a couple ways to do it. The way I'm showing it now, it is. It is the same. Uh, in the second case, it's not the problem generalization. No, we know it's not generalization because none of these probes are generalized. This is the same probe. That's a good question. This is the same probe, cold read, hot read. That's probe one. Probe two, whole new probe, but it's the same cold read, hot read. So we aren't assessing generalization here. So just think of ways to build in more repetition. And you can build in repetition within the, within the intervention session as well. For example, pocket words is something I use a lot. So at the end of the intervention, let's say you taught the kid some words or some letter sounds. Let's say you taught some letter sounds, let's do that. And so what you do is write down uh, either words that contain those letter sounds or just the letter on a card, put it in the kid's pocket. Throughout the day, you stop the kid and say, pocket words, pocket letters, pocket whatever, pocket math, pocket whatever. The kid has to pull them out, look at it, Read it to you. So if it's, a, if it's a word, you know, look at it and say house. You have to look at it and say house. Don't read it to them. All practice is not equal. Good practice has to have generation. It has to have generation. So to be good practice, the kids have to do something. So if you just take it and sort of review it with the kid, no, no, no. I, they have to look at it and generate the answer themselves. So I want them to look at it and say, they pull the word, okay, kid, pocket word. Kids pull it out and say house, tree, dog, whatever. If they get it wrong, then you can reteach it. That's fine. But throughout the day, just stop the kid, pocket words, pocket letters, pocket facts, pocket math, whatever, and have the kid pulled out and read them to you throughout the day. Also, you can do shorter sessions. If they're learning it in the first place and not remembering it, shorter intervention session, sessions more frequently, like twice per day. Always test for retention at the end of the, end of the session and at the end of the day. So at the end of the session, the kid just did it. Okay, have them, have them do what you just taught them. At the end of the day, have them do what you just taught them and then start the next session the next day with a review of the previous session. Okay. Oh yeah, several people asked about um, different reading passages every time. No, the way I was showing it, it was the same passage, cold read, hot, practice, 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 hot read. 
screen. We'll come back to Kim. I'll come back to your question later. Okay. Now, so that's learning it in the first place. And then lastly, I'm going to spend just a second on generalization because most of the time the kids aren't learning it in the first place or they aren't remembering it. It does happen sometimes that the kid really struggles with, with generalizing it. So I'll make you just a quick couple quick points on that validated program or modification. Uh, if the kid's not, learn, uh, not generalizing it for reading, look and think of this. The main reason kids don't comprehend reading is lack of background knowledge and vocabulary. So chances are, if the kid's struggling to generalize it, a good thing to do is teach them whatever it is you're teaching them, but then before they go to use it in reading, help them build their background knowledge and vocabulary. Okay, so if you teach a kid, um, uh, if you teach the kid, you're working on fluency with the kid. Okay, great. And then they, you go in and they go to read a generalized passage. Take it, take you know two minutes, look at the passage, ask them questions about the topic, about what it's about. It just help them to build background knowledge and vocabulary and, and do that uh, connection schematic activation. So ask the kid about it, maybe pre-teach some of the key words, that type of thing. Keep pre-teach the vocabulary. That will help them generalize it better than almost anything else we can do. Again, for math, because they're not focused on, on math, I just quickly mentioned the tool I use for math is schema-based instruction. So the kid learns it, they, they remember it, but they really struggle to apply it. Schema-based instruction is designed to do that. It's Asha Jatendra. I didn't put that on there. I don't know why I didn't. Jatendra is J-I-T-E-N-D-R-A. Jatendra. Asha Jatendra. Uh, Schema-based instruction. It's a little quick, easy instructional program designed to help kids generalize math better. Or you can use these simple cues systems where you show them how to generalize it by reading, paraphrasing, draw, plan, predict, compute, check. I laminate this. I give it to the kids. And when they learn the, they learn it during the intervention, but then they go to use it later, they pull this out to help them uh, generalize it. I can't repeat that spelling. In fact, maybe I'll put it in the chat box. It's J-I-T-E-N-D-R-A, J-I-T-E-N-D-R-A. Or you can uh, use concept maps. I didn't mention concept maps. That's a great way to help kids generalize but also teach it in the way you want the kids to learn it, right? So if you're trying to teach the kid decoding and they're learning decoding um, when they're there and they remember it, but they go to read it in a sentence and they're just so confused. Well then teach it to them in words and in sentences. For example, we're trying to teach this kid consonant blends and you know, really struggled with it. Well, then we dropped that. and We never, didn't teach him the consonant blend. We taught him words with the consonant blend. Like this case was MP, so jump, hump, um, camp, whatever. So we wouldn't teach them the sound. We just teach them the, the word with the sound in it and highlight the sound. And at the end of the lesson, have the kid read five sentences that contain that, that word. Okay. So that helps them generalize it into the word and then into a sentence. Same thing for NG, you know, teach them sing and whatever, other ones. And then um, at the end, so teach them five, 10 words that contain that. And at the end, go back and read those sentences with the word in it. Uh, these are some case examples. If I had time, I was going to walk through, but we don't have time to go through those, and that's that's fine. Um, uh, but here you can see this is a repeated reading. Kid was getting repeated reading, and he was not doing well. Uh, we did not see um, kids getting repeated reading, but we look at the data. He probably needs to have it backed up to be focusing on decoding. So you can see this if you look at this later. Um, this kid was getting um, uh, decoding intervention. And you see, was not doing very well. And look at the data. The kid probably needed more, um, uh, more modeling of the of, of decoding. So I gave you this article too as the handout. These are the data from it. So this is a teacher I worked with who was working with these kids. Uh, these are special ed uh, teachers. These are these are kids. This is a special ed teacher. These are kids with learning disabilities. And you see, they weren't weren't doing very well. And they were doing sound partners. So we tried switching it up. We tried comprehensiveness, more modeling. We tried transfer. And none of those worked, but once we realized the kid really needed dosage, then we see the kid took off. So this kid was learning it in the first place, but just couldn't remember it. So for that kid, dosage really helped. This second kid here, this kid, again, sound partners, 
the kid was not a kid this time was not learning in the first place. It sit at the end of the lesson couldn't do it. So we you do it more that didn't help. Try and transfer that didn't help. Okay, now we build in more modeling and explicit instruction, and the kid took off. Uh, let me. Um, okay, and then all right. So now let's get these kids. So come back to those 15 kids we're talking about with 17 kids. So these kids, um, once we figured out, we don't worry about the word BEA, stands for brief experimental analysis. We used to have a pretty involved process to determine where the breakdown was occurring, learning it in the first place, remembering it or generalizing it. But then we've learned you can just ask the person doing the intervention and get it right almost every single time. So once we got the data and modified the intervention, so more modeling if they weren't learning it in the first place or making it easier, backing it up, more repetition if they weren't remembering it, or transfer training explicitly for transfer and look at the rate of growth now compared to here. Man, we see huge jumps. The rates of growth really jumped for ever, almost every single kid. This kid was at 1.5 to 1.6. So not a huge change, but he's making 1.68 words per minute per week. That's pretty good. There's a couple, this kid's 3.43 now, he's rocking it. This kid's went from negative to positive three. So somebody asked, what do you know if it's time to make a referral to special ed? I got a couple of kids up there. Let me find one. Here's one. This kid, after 12 weeks of intensive intervention, which we've modified the intervention based on his need, and he's still making negative growth. I'm ready to refer that kid for special ed. This kid went from negative to positive. That's nice, but still 0 0.08. After 20 weeks of intervention, and we're really honed in on what the kid needs, I'm ready to move that for referral for special ed. This kid right here, the student number nine, after 16 weeks, still only making 1.06. That's not great. You might consider special ed for that one, or this kid here after uh, 23 weeks, still only at 0.46. Um, but I might continue to try for a few more weeks, but probably those kids are the ones I'm ready to, to move for special ed. These other kids are doing fine. They're making really good growth. And then coming back to my little friend, uh, uh, Lonnie. So what we figured out with Lonnie was he wasn't, he was, he learned, he had phonemic awareness, but he wasn't learning it in the first place. So we're trying to do IR, incremental rehearsal with him. And I have a video of it, but for time's sake, I won't show it. So what we did was we, we used pictures as knowns. And again, he had phonemic awareness. So we took H, the letter we're trying to teach him, and paired it with a picture of a hammer. He knew hammer started with And it used to be, we would sit down with him, use IR, teach him the letter, the letter sound. And at the end of it, I teach him the letter sound for T. And I show it to him, even though I just did it and say, hey, Lonnie, what's it say? He'd look at the T and go, S you have no idea. We just taught it to him. Didn't learn it in the first place. So once we backed it up and made it, no, no, back it up. Once we made it easier, so now we teach him H. All you have to do is look at hammer. Hammer says, starts with, huh. so H says, huh. we taught to him that way. At the end of this lesson, I held up the letter H. He looked at it and went, huh. and it was the first time in the entire year that he got that right. Now, during the school year, he was referred for special ed testing and uh, they were diagnosed him as intellectual disability. And the uh, went to the IEP and they're gonna start to, uh, to write, the, write the kid up for special ed and the parent refused services. The single mom, I wasn't at the meeting, I'm only telling you what, what I heard she said. I said, you know what, this is working. Now, these are what she told me, this is what I heard she said. You're not gonna take my little African-American son call them mentally retarded, throw them in special ed and, and call it good. No, this is working, I wanna keep trying it. We, and so we did, and it took forever to figure out what was going on. But once we came back to that framework of learning in the first place, remembering it, generalizing it, and realized he was not learning it in the first place, let's make it easier, he learned it. Now, it, this was in kindergarten. By the end of second grade, this supposed you know, intellectual disability child was a grade level reader. Now it took a lot of work, but we got him there. That's why I never accept conversations about, oh, it didn't really work, you know, it doesn't work for this kid. No, no, no. Because sometimes the questions are complicated, but the answers are simple. Paring it down to those three things and figure out where the breakdown is happening will help you. Now, some of you have asked the questions about how you know we're referred to special ed. Hopefully I answered that. Um, somebody asked about second grader who still struggles keeping vowel sounds straight. Teach it to them. Can they do it once they teach it to them? Teach them E and I. And can they differentiate once you're done? If not, then not more modeling. If they can, more repetition, et cetera. So go back and think about the same thing, learning in the first place, remembering it, 
or generalizing it. Great. This is a handout, which is the, the um, a chart that lays out everything I just talked about today, different programs and, and adaptions you can use. I, I try to answer questions as we go, so hopefully I got to all of them. Because uh, I believe we are up with time now, correct? Great. Um, all right. So do you need, a, do you give exit quarter, Amanda, anything you need to do? Yes, I would like to thank you uh, so much and all who attended this wonderful session. There's comments coming in, as you can see. Um, everyone really enjoyed this session. Uh, the session recording will be available on the Patent YouTube channel in the near future. Uh, the session.